Good afternoon. It is Tuesday. It is power session time. I am your host, Paul Blanchard, president of the Augmentino Leadership Institute. I'm super excited to be with you guys today, as always. So um, don't want to wait forever for everybody to jump on. But as many of you know, I do like to give a chance for a few people of our, our regulars to jump on here and we'll we'll get rocking and rolling. So hello, welcome. Hey, Jill, Bobby's in the house, literally and online. Uh, Miriam, Kim, awesome. Very cool. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Super excited to be here. It is power session time, one of my favorite times of the week. I love doing this. I've been doing these for well, almost four years now on Tuesdays. And for those of you who don't know, if you're just new to this session, these power sessions we've been doing for a long time, but they used to be exclusive to our, our paying coaching clients. Those were the only people that got access to, access to them on Tuesdays in a private portal, a private webinar. And we just we decided because of what people were getting out of these and how it wouldn't it wouldn't change anything for us in terms of the value we deliver and what we get compensated for um, uh, to be able to open this up for people that are trying to get to know us. People are trying to discover the value of focusing on your habits and not the habits that you do. There are plenty of books and people out there and things that want to talk to you about the habits that they do and, and what you should do to build a habit, how long it takes to build a habit. Those are usually extrinsic habits. Those are habits around practical judgment, uh, uh, common sense, around systems and structure, which are all a part of what we do. But where we start is as far upstream as you can get, and that is your thinking habits, your thoughts which are often unconscious. These are thinking habits that we have going on unconsciously, meaning they're under the surface. They are often counterintuitive to what we think is going on. I get the opportunity as a coach, as do my other coaches and my habit finder specialists, to be able to have someone take an assessment that takes about 10, 15 minutes to scientifically measure the way that you think on an unconscious level. Just like you couldn't tell me uh, what an EKG could tell me, even though your heart is inside your body right now and, and the awareness should be accessible to you. Well, it's the same thing with your mind. Your unconscious mind has elements to it. That's why it's unconscious that you don't have access to. So that's why we honed, spent, we invested millions of dollars in honing this technology, the habit finder, to be able to measure that so we could spend time actually shifting the things from the source. Because if you've ever had that experience in life where you can see what's possible, you can see what you can accomplish, but there's some unseen force holding you back in one area or multiple areas, and, and even oftentimes the harder you fight against it, the more exhausted and burnt out you become and the more it seems to win, that's what we're talking about, our unconscious habits of thinking. Not to mention that there are very powerful strengths, just untapped potential in your mind where your brain operates in a way that would really serve you, if we could relieve some of the pressure over here, you could actually experience it. You could experience that kind of genius that everybody has. Everybody's got genius, and that's not from a you know raw, raw participation trophy. Everybody has it. Accessing it is oftentimes what gets mistaken as genius in this world, because that's the actual implementation, the actual uh, manifestation of your genius. And honestly, I can see why people feel that way because that's the only uh, genius that matters is the genius you're willing to, to sacrifice to get to, the, the one you're willing to work hard to build the habits around to support those gifts. Now, interestingly, on another note, while we're allowing people to jump on here, um, this is my philosophical intro for those of you that have never been in, in a, a power session before, uh, is also understanding that the greatest challenges we have in our thinking actually comes from our greatest gifts. It's really interesting to me that when we view things, and those of you who also aren't used to this, I, this is my whiteboard. We're really good friends. We've done a lot for people together. Well, the whiteboard deserves more of the credit. But uh, when, uh, when we get focused on our weaknesses, there's a really interesting energy and mentality that comes with that. A weakness is just that. We view it as something that is weak. It is something that we need to get rid of. It's something we need to eliminate. It's something that we need to uh, break through. These have been very common mentalities and philosophies for personal development, 
Find your weaknesses, okay? Get rid of them, eliminate it, or break through them. There's a really interesting energy that comes with that that is not productive to the way your mind works. Because when we realize that everything, okay, everything you need to succeed on a neurological level, on a thought process level, is already there. Meaning the most valuable things are already there waiting for you to access them more often and to be able to stay there longer. So if the goal is to access them more often and to be able to stay in that space a little bit longer, because everything you need is, is already there with you in terms of the way you think, which, can, which results in the actions you take and the emotions you feel and the decisions you make and ultimately the results you create. All of that is already within you and we just need to access it more often and stay there longer, then what place does this have? How contradictory is that energy when we bring it to this space? To the fact that you are an intrinsic priceless human being, beyond value, unique to you, your own unique genius, your own abilities, your own strengths. And we can so often get into this space, and if we don't do this with ourselves, we probably do it with others, or even worse, we do it with both, where we seek out the weaknesses. They're not a runner. They're not, they're not this. They're not that. I need to focus on people that are. I need to get rid of them. I need to eliminate them, or I need to force a break through, keyword being break. How many of you have ever tried to get to, to a breakthrough only to break yourself? Or try to help somebody else get a breakthrough and they break down? Because that's often what's inevitable when we rely on that versus being in the right mentality, being in the space that allows us to understand that what we're seeking is not a destination. Where is my eraser? Usually I have it sitting right here. Now we are going to play a game. <laughs> Where is Paul's eraser? I'll use a tissue for now so I can find that. What did I do with it? Interesting. Okay. Well, I have a tissue. Okay. So we'll use that for right now until I can track down wherever that... Oh, I know where it went. In fact, let me just give you a little tour here of my office. Over there is another giant whiteboard. And we were doing some planning over there. Um, and so I took the eraser over there. Now that you can see where I'm going and what's going on in here. Sometimes you can't quite get the total scope of my office from this zoomed in webcam. All right, cool, got the eraser. Here's the challenge. Here's you in terms of where you typically live, okay? And here is peak performance. This is peak performance right here at this top level. Let me see if I can, it's kind of bright outside. I wanna make sure you guys can see it. My, I, those of you who haven't seen on this side of my office is uh, all the mountains and the bright light coming in that's blurring the screen a little bit. So sorry about that. Um, so here's you and here's peak performance. So many people are trying to do their way to peak performance. And so we try to get as close as we can, try to get as close as we can. We might even experience peak performance, then we can't sustain it. So we kick the crap out of ourselves all the way back down. And the you that you were, as this process repeats, ends up down here. And we get further and further and further away from our peak performance. Why? Because we're trying to do, trying to do peak performance rather than what we want to be doing, what we want to be focused on, and that is what we are becoming. That's where the you right here gets to right here. And the you right here gets to right here. But guess what? As that happens, your peak performance also increases. So we want to maintain a healthy gap between you, which is your status quo, and peak performance. Because guess what? Hate to break it to you. There will always be a gap. There will always be a gap between where you naturally live and your peak performance. One of the things that I want to create today is an awareness, a curiosity, even a sensitivity to where your healthy gap is between where you naturally live and your peak performance. 
And if you extend where you feel like your peak performance can be, make sure you're stepping you up. Another term we use for this is not just status quo, it's mediocre. Specifically, I'm not a big fan of mediocre, but I'm a big fan of your mediocre. Your mediocre means your status quo, your most reliable level of performance. Your mediocre is your most reliable level of performance. Mathematically speaking, it's the average, it's the median of how you operate. You have your highs, you have your lows, but your most consistent level of performance is your mediocre. It might be here, okay, and your peak performance is here, but if you just try and do and busy yourself to this, then the, your mediocre is gonna continue to slip and your peak performance will continue to be more and more out of reach until you give up, bail, and many of us don't do that gracefully. That business wasn't for me, I hate this and I hate that and they messed up this and they messed up that and all those things can challenge that gap between you, your mediocre, which is actually a beautiful word, it comes from median, which means the middle, and ochre, which means uh, jagged mountain. So your mediocre is halfway up, it's the middle of, halfway up the jagged mountain. And jagged mountain's a beautiful analogy for life as an entrepreneur, as a leader, getting an opportunity to understand all the cliffs and the challenges and the scaling that, that is required to be able to grow. So let's trust you and let's become more aware of this gap. And that's kind of what we're gonna be talking about today in terms of gaps, okay? In terms of what we do. Now, when it comes to doing, which seems to be everybody's natural bias, this is what I hear all the time. Paul, be more practical. Give me the practical stuff. Tell me what to do. Tell me what not to do. That's, that's what we thrive on oftentimes because we know the basic equation that if we do this over a sustained period of time, we'll get this. So I've got do plus time equals a result. That's a really nice equation if you weren't a part of it. You, okay? You, which is a human being, not a human doing, Okay, you are a human being, are part of this equation. Are you inserting yourself into this equation? Or are you just focused on what you should do, how much time it's taking, and the results you're getting or not getting? Is that the measure of your life? What you do or don't do, how much time it takes or doesn't take, and the results you get or don't get. Because if this is what you're trying to accomplish, no wonder it is exhausting and repetitious and boring and taxing, and some of us stick in long enough to be able to find some kind of result that could justify the strain that this required by not putting you, the most important part of this equation. You are the most important part of this equation because you do the doing. You maximize or limit the time, and you enjoy or hate the result. That's you. So rather than be an observer of the equation of your life, let's jump into the equation. How do you jump into the equation? Well, you've got do plus time to the power of you equals extraordinary results. Do plus time to the power of you. Not you observing this equation, you getting into the equation. What's interesting about this in mathematics, this to the power of, they call it a force multiplier, which is a beautiful thing, okay? A force multiplier is something that adds value at an exponential rate that can't totally be explained. For example, when you were young and you went to something you didn't want to be at, like a recital or you went to church or whatever, then you didn't want to be there. That hour or two hours or whatever it was that you were there felt like it took all day. That would be a negative force multiplier. It changed your perception because you are in this equation. It changed what time felt like. If you've got a project you are so passionate about and so excited about 
time just flew by because the power of you was focused on the doing at a force multiplier. Suddenly you weren't counting the time or the cost and, and it was just incredible. You were totally present and totally engaged in it. That's a force multiplier. If you want a more real example, my wife showed me this video the other day of these two Clydesdales pulling this huge truck and this giant trailer it was towing, pulling it out of the snow to the point that it was, it was torquing the truck around. These two Clydesdales, that's a huge load and, they're just, and, and the truck couldn't move at all. I mean, it was just spinning. It was like it was on ice skates. And these two horses hook up and just whoom, whip this thing around. Amazing. What I love about the video is because it's my favorite reminder of a force multiplier. Okay. One Clydesdale. Okay. And I don't remember the numbers exactly. I just remember the ratios. But one Clydesdale can pull like six, 7,000 pounds, something like that. Two Clydesdales can pull like 21,000 pounds. And there were two Clydesdales in this video, so that's what it made me think of. That's a force multiplier. That it's very difficult for mathematics to assume that, you know, force plus velocity, whatever, blah, 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 all the dynamics of, of, uh, of uh, that side of math that I don't understand, of physics that I don't totally understand, um, shouldn't, should be that if one horse can pull X, then two horses can pull two times X. But as a force multiplier, there is something unexplainable about the energy of the horses together and their ability to work off of each other and a whole bunch of other variables that we don't have time to talk about that create a force multiplier. You, you are the full force multiplier of what you do and the time that it takes. When you're focused on what you can do, you're on, and we talked last week about a systemic scale. You're on a singular scale, okay? So for example, let me erase this. Okay, just remember this. Most of us are operating a do plus time equals result equation rather than the proper one, which is do plus time to the power of you to create the results you really want to have. So keep that in mind. That's critical as we're going through this. Okay. And so if we're in a doing world, okay, and I have 100% capacity available to me every day, okay, this is, this is uh, the graph of capacity, okay? But I'm a little tired, I'm a little stressed, okay? I've got a lot going on right now. So my capacity goes down to starting the day at 80%. So right off the bat, I'm already at a handicap, okay? Because doing is happening to me. So what is happening to me is affecting my doing. My doing is happening to me, so what I'm doing or what, what is happening to me is affecting my doing, okay? Hopefully that made sense. So I'm starting at 80%, and then I've got, I've got chores to do or I've got stuff to do at work and different things, and so what I've got done at work then takes me down, because that's quite a bit, to 40%. Now I've got 40% capacity left. And, uh, and then I need some time with my family so they know who I am and get some time with me and whatever. And I'm trying to be present there, but I'm doing it even though my mind's somewhere else. Now I've got 30% of my capacity left. And now I want to go focus on a business that I want to grow that requires 100% of me. Not 100% of my time. Not 100% of what I do, but 100% of me but I only have 30% of me left. How on earth am I supposed to change that equation, Paul? Well, when you're in a doing mentality, then what is happening to you will affect your doing and what you're doing will happen to you rather than you happen to it, rather than you, remember, do plus time to the power of you equals extraordinary results but we're in a doing mentality, so we're at the limit of what this does. And then we're also at the mercy of what our perspective creates and what we can do. For example, I've seen people who have had 100% capacity, okay? And this is a silly example, but it drives the point home, so please pay attention closely, okay? Just checking up on comments, okay? Then it's time to do laundry, okay? 
I've got to do laundry. Now for a lot of people, laundry does this. I've got 30% of us left after doing laundry. Why did it do that? Why did doing laundry, one of the simplest things required of us on a consistent basis, drain us so bad? Well, lots of reasons. The first one is because we were focusing on doing a really simple thing, okay? So we were, the do part was super simple, but the thinking was incredibly complex. So the result was a drain on both our ability to do and our ability to think. That's what happened. Because if we really break it down, and this is a principle, okay? So I've met one person last year that loved doing laundry. So this didn't make sense to her, okay? But most everybody else gets what I mean. I want you, it's not about laundry, okay? It's, a, it's about other things in life that we treat the same way. Because in laundry, you've got two minutes max, okay? To pour your clothes into the washer and pour the detergent in and hit start. Then you've got one minute to grab it out of the washer, put it in the dryer, and hit start. Then after that, you've got 15 minutes to pull it out, fold it, and put it away, conservatively. That is 18 minutes. 18 minutes of your day, and there are <laughs> If I remember correctly, uh, 24 times 60, there are 1,440 minutes in your day, okay? So you got 1,440 minus 18 equals 1,422 minutes left, okay? Let's say that you are sleeping seven hours Seven times 60, so that's gonna be minus 420, which is really simple math. Love that when it works out that way. So we still have 1,002 minutes left in the day. But how often do we allow laundry, as an example, remember I'm not making this about, about uh, oh, maybe it, <laughs> maybe it was Rosanna that loves laundry. Um, but the dishes, okay, same concept, perfect. So find what this applies to you because what you'll find is when you're focused on the doing, you're at mercy of this drain on where you're thinking and where you're at because most people think that laundry takes hours. Most people think that laundry takes hours, not takes 18 minutes. It's true because when they started it, when they started the doing and when it was completed, that took hours, but the actual activity didn't. It's your mind's way of manipulating rather than you being the force multiplier, it's happening to you and manipulating the space in between your actions. It is manipulating the space between your actions. That's why laundry feels like it takes hours when it really takes 18 to 20 minutes, max if you're totally present, totally available, and getting it done. So why is it so hard to take the laundry, because it's three stages here, put it into the thing, pour in detergent, hit start, and then engage in something else? Because we're just focusing on the doing, so we're not aware of the complex thinking that's going on. Or we're not even present to putting the stuff in the laundry bin. We're just thinking about everything we have to do and how now I can't leave the house because I've got to be here to switch this over to the dryer. And now I can't do this and I can't do that. And we get into the I can't mentality, which is a very common symptom of overdoing. And we start managing what we can't do rather than expanding and force multiplying what we can do. But guess what? You cannot, and I want to make this really clear. Let me come in super close super close. You cannot get out of a doing problem by doing more. Okay. There is no way to do your way out of a doing problem. It's impossible. If you, if any of this resonated with you, 
and you have a doing problem. There's nothing to do to get out of it because the doing is the problem. If that's what we're trying to solve. I just take a second to take this in because it's, it's astronomically amazing to me how many of us are trying to do our way out of a doing problem. We do too much, we do too little, we beat ourselves up, we, we're in our minds and tolerating our reality and all this different stuff. And so then I get on these power sessions or we get in our coaching sessions and people are like, what do I do? <laughs> okay. We don't do our ways out of a doing problem. Doing is the natural outcome of effective becoming. The challenge is there's enough people out there in this industry, there's enough books that have just been fluff and crap, and there's enough strengths that are out of control in our mind that when we have tried to surrender to the becoming part, it just messed up the doing. Because you didn't have the right guide. You didn't have the right principles, the right habits, and understanding the habits of thinking that are gonna get in your way when it is time to become. Because it comes down to a simple, simple equation. That's the theme of today, simple equations. What's hard will become easy. What's easy will become hard. Doing usually results in this. Because doing is the easiest thing. Do this, don't do that. That's systemic, that's black and white, that's right or wrong, that's all or nothing. So it's easy. Your brain loves easy. So it wants that. It wants to know what to do. But over time, what seemed so easy in the moment when you were sitting in that training, hearing about how to rock it on Facebook and to be amazing at this and do this, and you're sitting there with your doing mind going, ooh, that sounds easy, that's awesome. But then you get home and run into this big old Greyhound bus of hard. Because when you were there listening to what sounded easy, all those habits of thinking that usually get in your way on a day-to-day -day basis, they didn't get invited to the event. They didn't get to come to convention. They didn't get to go into that training or that webinar or read that book with you quietly on a Sunday afternoon. They quieted down. No wonder it felt so easy. And then we dove in and it got really hard. And so it became easy to bail on that, which now bailing has become really hard. But now we're stuck between a hard place and a hard place. What used to be so easy to just do over time became hard. And it's not getting us where we want to go, but now the only alternative is more hard. That kind of sucks, but it's a reality. So be okay with that. Be okay with the fact that many of you may be stuck right here, where the easy crap in your life, what used to be easy, has become really hard. And now to get to the easy you want, which most of you call freedom, to get to freedom, you have to go through this. You have to go through what's now gonna be hard and make it easy, which you can only do with habits, period, end of story, okay? To be able to reach freedom. But here's the problem, most of us get here and we just want this. We just want to go to this. We want to skip this. Just tell me what I should do to get to here. But then we keep circling ourselves back into here. Keep circling ourselves back into here rather than willing to make the commitment, make the decision that is required to make this journey. Because it is a hard journey, it's difficult. But with passion, a willingness to suffer for, a realization that eventually freedom will become a feeling. That's what freedom is. Freedom is a feeling. Freedom isn't because it's actually a really scary goal to have. We talk about this with our clients all the time. The two most dangerous goals you can have, financial freedom and time freedom. The two most dangerous goals you can have because more than likely you're in some kind of dilemma here and you're wanting freedom, which is defined as a lack of resistance. And a lack of resistance is really scary when it comes to your strength and your growth. Like when they send astronauts to space and for an extended period of time and they realize how weak they became. The lack of resistance, okay? Very similar, zero gravity is to your mind's desire for freedom, because what it really wants, what it really wants is freedom from doing, because that's what you've been doing. You haven't had an opportunity to find the space to become. 
Just keep doing, just keep doing. How do I do to get to freedom? It's impossible, it doesn't flow that way. It is impossible to do to freedom. Freedom is a feeling we get when we become the person that naturally does X, fill in the blank. Freedom is the feeling we get when we become the person that naturally does X, fill in the blank, that naturally posts on Facebook, that naturally makes phone calls, that naturally wakes up earlier, naturally takes care of their body, naturally does those things. Doesn't mean easily does those things, but naturally, because it's always going to be difficult. I get up at 4.30 in the morning and go to the gym almost every morning, okay? I had a couple of weeks early on this year where it was kind of hard to do that, some injuries and other things, and it's so easy to see that slip. It was natural, but it's really easy to see that slip. That's part of this process. It's never gonna be perfect. You're never gonna get to the place where you don't have to worry about money ever again, because the people who get there feel like they don't have to worry about money anymore because they have become so attentive and honoring and responsible with their money. You're never gonna get to a place where you can do whatever you want with your time. You can get to a place where you can feel like you can do whatever you want, but it's because you have become so responsible, so clear about what you're doing with your time. Because remember, where we started all this, these choices, the easy to hard and the hard to easy, there is an infinite number of those choices in your life. And as soon as you make the decision to do what's hard and will become easy, you're gonna run into another one, and another one, and another one. Because what we're doing is understanding life is decisions, AKA choices, to take the you that is here and your peak performance, PP, and move them up together. When you raise your peak performance, you raise you. When you raise your peak performance, you raise you. When you raise you, you raise your peak performance. Finding that healthy space and knowing that it'll never be perfect. Finding joy right here in this journey. Not in whether you can get to peak performance from doing and stay there long enough that eventually you can be free. Free from doing. I don't know if you've noticed this planet, but most people who find freedom from doing that kind of retirement, their health fails quickly. They lose motivation and drive and purpose, which is what fuels our soul, fuels our lives. So if you have a doing problem and you're, com you're compounding it with a desire to someday find, and you're doing so that you can find freedom from doing, whew, time for a quick, and ma actually not a quick, time for a huge, massive timeout. Okay, now I wanna show you what to do about it. So it sounds like a lot of people are resonating with this. This is a very common syndrome, whether it happens to you in micro areas or macro themes across your life, okay? Let me show you what to do about it. Let me introduce you, show you what to do about your doing problem. I'm contradicting myself. Let me introduce you to a way you can become more familiar with you so that you can become who you already are. Because remember, you already have everything you need to become. You have everything you need to become. And as you embrace that, as you pull those layers off, the doing and even what to do and what to do it with, starts falling into alignment with the becoming. And here's an example to help you drive this a little bit deeper, okay? There is a common theme, okay, between doing effectively and becoming effectively. There is an ingredient in both. If you've got a doing problem, okay, and you'd like to figure out how to become, or you are becoming, there is a common ingredient in both, and it is this. Action. Action is required for both. That's one of the ways people have gone wrong when they're having this false dichotomy 
between do and become. I've seen a lot of people in this industry for a long time that have assumed that to become doesn't include this. This is reading a book. This is attending training and seminars and thinking about and da-da-da-da-da. No, that's all stuff to prepare you for how to become. And the do is all this and just this. That's one of the challenges. One of the most difficult things that it creates, though, is the doing, having a doing problem, often leads to inaction, which means a lack of action, a lack of intentional, passion-driven action. See, you can, you can do without being without being in action. You can. I've seen plenty of people do without the action, and I'm talking about the action Og was talking about in scroll nine. The spark, the tinder that lights the map and the plans and the goals and brings it to life. That action. I've seen people do all day around real action, but it usually is inaction, meaning a lack of action, a lack of progress a lack of effective operation, a lack of effective operation. That's why we wanna look at our results to gauge which side of the scale we're on. Because results, simply put, tell the truth of how well we're harnessing action and whether we're in doing or becoming. Because most people that are doing the actions that they think they're supposed to be doing without the becoming part don't have the results that they want, which doesn't make sense. I'm doing this and I'm putting the time in. Why am I not getting the results? Because often we're oblivious to the inaction, the inaction of our energy, of our alignment, like we talked about last week with systemic thinking and realizing that if we're trying to apply systemic force, to intrinsic people, we're going to be very limited in what we can do. We can focus on what we're becoming and what they can become. Then a beautiful things happen. A beautiful thing happens, and this is one of the keys to getting the results that you want. Okay. You have inaction, which feels like this. Okay. Busy, busy, busy. Or procrastinate, procrastinate, procrastinate. And you can do both, by the way. I've seen very busy procrastinators. In fact, they're usually the ones who are the best at it. They push it off just a little bit to relieve some of that stress and anxiety, but not so far off that they sound the alarm, we're being irresponsible, just a little bit, okay? Busy, 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 procrastinate, burnout, um, overdone, overcooked, um, uh, insensitive, all the things that come from this. That's inaction, okay? That comes from either uh, having a problem with doing or having a problem with not doing, which usually comes from the same thought processes. A lot of people that are not doing spent too much time trying to do. They just have different capacities in terms of how long they could sustain that. But inevitably, if you just are doing, you will end up in action. You will end up busy, 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 procrastinating or not acting uh, out of a fear that it won't be good enough, okay? That's inaction, but what's interesting, what's beautiful, is this right here, and you know how much I love words. If we put a space and change it to in action rather than inaction, inaction actually means that we are in a condition, I love that for this particular example, a condition of effective operation. Now here's the symbolism. My favorite part of this example, okay? Is that the only difference between inaction, a lack of action, busy, 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 procrastination, burnout, frustration, lack of fulfillment from relationships, all the things that come from that, and being in action in a condition of effective operation is space. A space. 
is the difference between the two sides. Now, in this case, literally a space bar, but we mean, of course, symbolically, space. Room. Room to breathe. Room to be. Room to experience. Room to process. Room to live. Because we live in the space. We live in the space. When we're in a doing mentality, all we can focus on are the blips through the day of the doing. But remember the laundry example? If we totaled these up, it's only 18 minutes, 20 minutes, but it felt like ah, 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 so much more because we weren't learning about the space in between the actions. What is your space in between the actions? How can you start to come, become more familiar with your space, your room to breathe? What kind of priority is this making? If this is the difference between burnout, procrastination, lack of fulfillment in relationships, being stuck and blah, 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 and everything else, the difference between that and being in a condition of effective operation, meaning achieving your dreams, having that feeling of freedom rather than this impossible destination that most of us think that it is, if the difference between those two things is simply space, that's where becoming happens. That's where we set it up. It's in between the things that we're doing. It's, and more importantly, actually not more importantly, but in addition to, it's in between the things we're seeing. The first place we start with any clients we work with, whether they're publicly traded companies or entrepreneurs and home-based businesses or anything in between, you start with connection, which is all about understanding the space in between what we say and the space in between what they're saying. Find the space. Become aware of the space. One of the greatest things you can do to, to become aware of this is start your day with you. Start your day in this space. Don't start your day with your phone. Heaven for, I mean, don't start your day with your kids, if I could be so bold. Start your day with you. My favorite equation, because it was taught to me by my coach, is to wake up, drink a glass of water, go for a walk, and breathe. It is the best way to start your day in this space so that you can set the tone of being a conscious and intentional creator, becoming, so that when you get to action, you are in space, action, not in action. Procrastination, fear, uh, overdone, overcooked, lack of fulfillment, hoping that someday we'll get to the point where all this doing is worth it. Because when we can start with us and do, then we become the force multiplier. Then it can become do plus time to the power of you, because you took time to find you and create your dreams. Create extraordinary results as a force multiplier. Okay? I've shared this quote several times, but I want you to write it down right now in context to what we're talking about. And that is that small hinges swing big gates. A space it makes all the difference in those two. A little space, a little curiosity, a little awareness, a little bit. Not trying to overdo it around what you're currently doing could make all the difference. But Paul, I'm doing all the right things. I'm not getting the results. Well, take a second and think about why you're doing them. And I literally mean take a second. Don't stew on it for hours. Oftentimes that's inaction, procrastination, that's from too much doing. We got burned out from too much doing. 
but we don't want to totally bail on what we're committed to doing. So now we're spending more time thinking, which is just, you know, uh, an even more dangerous version of, of doing. We're trying to think our way out of a thinking problem. And then we get into doing and we try to do our way out of a doing problem. Then we get burned out and we go back into thinking about how to think, how to get out of our thinking problem. And then eventually we get fed up with that. So we go start doing to fix our doing problem. And let's break the cycle because it's only a subtle shift. It's a small hinge to swing this gate. We work with our clients constantly on how to recognize this space. How do we become more curious and sensitive about the space between the actions? If you're ready to take that on at a deeper and higher level, let us know. If you haven't taken the habit finder to understand what thought processes are making it difficult for you to find that space, what processes or what thought processes are making it difficult for you to become that are wreaking havoc on your life in terms of trying to do your way out of a doing problem or think your way out of a thinking problem, go to habitfinder.com and take it. Take a look at the thought processes. Meet with one of my specialists for free. If you know someone and you've already done this and you've seen value from these sessions, you've worked with us in coaching, then please tell them about it today. Tell them to go to habitfinder.com. Whether they're in the same business as you or they're in your family or whatever, give us an opportunity to help them find the space between their action or the space between their lack of action so that they don't have to keep hitting their head up against the wall of trying to do them way, their way out of a doing problem or think their way out of a thinking problem. It's very natural for human beings to do this, but that's why we start with such a counterintuitive approach. Doing is very important, just like systemic thinking is very important, but not if it's being put as a higher priority to you. And not if, it, if the doing is more important than them, whoever them is for you, okay? This is a space you've gotta be able to get into and then act, and then get into and act. And eventually being in this space and acting will become the same thing. And that's when we become intentional creators. Thanks so much for being here today for today's power session. I really appreciate it. Please leave in the comments any questions you've got anything you're, you're trying to figure out. But if it feels like that's not enough, Paul, then you definitely have a doing problem, okay? If you make this too complicated and you stew on this for the rest of the day, then you've got a thinking problem. You're gonna wanna find out how to navigate that for you because the world is waiting for the best version of you, the version of you that you already have. Neurologically, it's already in there. There's some patterns that have compensated for things in your life, choices you've made, things that have happened to you that are limiting your ability to increase your mediocre that will ultimately increase your peak performance and find joy in that journey. Thanks, everybody. Have an awesome day. We'll see you next week.